Dr. Kent Hovind is considered by many to be one of the leading authorities on science and the Bible. Dedicated to the proclamation of factual scientific evidence supporting the biblical record of creation, his fact-filled informative seminars cause even the most devout evolutionist to sit up and take notice. Thank you for watching this condensed version of our 17-hour seminar series presented by Dr. Kent Hovind. This version presents just a few of the highlights from parts one through four of our seven-part series. Coming up, you're going to see real science that proves the Earth cannot be billions of years old and see how the science that's been discovered totally undermines the theory of evolution. Dr. Hovind covers topics like the Big Bang Theory, the first and second law of thermodynamics, the conservation of angular momentum, and the population growth rate, just to name a few. Enjoy part one of the seminar series. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now for 16 years I've been an evangelist doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And I tell people right up front that I believe the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of the living God. I believe it from cover to cover. I even believe the cover on mine, it says Kent Hovind. And for those that don't know, the Bible is your basic instructions before leaving earth. You really ought to read the book because you're going to be gone for an awfully long time. I mean, when you leave here, there ain't no coming back, so make sure you're going to the right spot. Okay, now, one of my jobs as a Christian is to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that's in us. I think in the last few hundred years, the Christians have not done a good job of answering this evolution theory, and we've allowed this philosophy of evolution, actually it's a religion, we've allowed this religion to take over our school system, our legal system, our whole thinking process now is based on a philosophy which has zero scientific evidence, none. We've been offering a quarter million dollars for anybody with any real scientific ev evidence for evolution. That offer's been out there about 12 years now. There is no evidence for it whatsoever. People believe in it, I understand, but that doesn't make it science. Now, there are two ways to look at this world. That's called your world view. How do you view this world? Some people look at the world one way and some look at another way. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the way you view the world determines how you will answer the four great questions of life. There are four fundamental questions that every single religion on planet Earth tries to answer. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? The way you answer those questions is totally determined by your worldview. Some people look at the world and say, you know, it's amazing. A big bang made this from nothing. That's the humanist worldview based on the evolution theory. Other people look at the world and say, you know, there's incredible design. There must be a designer. That's the creationist worldview based on creation. And those two worldviews are at war with each other. I mean, somebody is wrong. And I enjoy showing them who they are. We like science. We're not against science. But I'm against poison mixed in with the science. That's all. Here's a first grade textbook. I'll show you what I'm talking about. They tell the kids in first grade, Earth has changed much since its formation four and a half billion years ago. Now just hold on a minute. Is the Earth four and a half billion years old? No, as we'll see in a minute. But if you tell that to a first grader, he's going to believe you. First graders believe everything you tell them. <laughs> I did. And then tell them again in second grade. Since its formation four and a half billion years ago, Earth has changed. Down at the bottom it says, life too has evolved on Earth. This word evolved is a very tricky word. I've done over 90 debates and about 7,000 radio and TV call-in talk shows, and I've learned how to win the debate on evolution in the first five minutes. It is so easy. If somebody says, do you believe in evolution? I say, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, evolution. No, which one are you talking about? There are six meanings to the word. Are you talking about cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter? I don't believe in that with the Big Bang. We'll talk about that in a minute. Are we talking about chemical evolution? Because according to the Big Bang theory, the Big Bang, you know, <clears throat> produced hydrogen and maybe some helium. Well, then how did we get all these other elements? Do you want me to believe uranium evolved from hydrogen? They'll say, well, yeah, fusion. You have fusion in stars. Yeah, but you can't fuse past iron very well. Number two, you've got a chicken and an egg problem here because you have to have the stars to make the elements and the elements to make the stars. Which one came first? Which brings up, of course, stellar evolution. How did the stars form? You know, nobody's ever seen a star form. Scientists don't even have a clue how a star could form. No even good theories about star formation. We cover more on that on video seven. But... We see stars blow up all the time. It's called a nova or a supernova if it's a big one. Well, that happens all the time. But we never see one form. And yet there's enough stars out there that we know about that everybody on planet Earth, every single individual, can personally own 
11 trillion stars to yourself. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. Fourthly, there's going to have to be organic evolution. Life has to get started from non-living material. Nobody has a clue how that could happen. Then we're going to have to have what's called macroevolution. That's where an animal changes to a different kind of animal. Do you know nobody has ever seen a dog produce a non-dog? Never. You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you're going to get a dog every time. And it could be that the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. They probably did. But every five-year-old kid knows they're the same kind of animal. I'll show you. Is anybody in here five or six? Who's five or six years old? Anybody? How about, we got one? Oh, okay. How old are you, buddy? Six? I want you to take a test. Here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is different than the rest of them? The banana. Give them a hand. All right. Very good. <laughs> We have college professors can't figure that out, okay? <laughs> the Bible says the animals are going to bring forth after their kind. Now, Charlie Darwin wrote a book on the table down here called Origin of Species. See, a dog and a wolf are the same kind of animal, but they're different species. He fooled everybody by changing the word from kind to species. We'll get into more of that on video four. Lastly, we have what is called microevolution. This is changes within the kinds. Now that one happens. I'll go along with number six. I think animals can produce a whole variety of offspring. You know, long hair, short hair, long-legged, short-legged. That happens. But the first five are purely religious. That's not science. We never observe any of those. So if you want to win the debate on evolution, simply define exactly what you're talking about. And you'll find all they ever give are examples of number six, which there's no argument about it. It happens. But then they imply that that is somehow magically evidence for the other five, and it is not. The teachers are taught, though, be sure to stress to the students that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure the kids believe this. Now, I happen to be a little old-fashioned. I think in science class we should be teaching science. Things we can observe and study and test and demonstrate. Things like the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics tells us matter cannot be created or destroyed. Well, everything's made out of matter, so if matter cannot be created or destroyed, then how did the world get here? We're here, you know. So that leaves only two choices. Somebody made the world, or the world made itself. So either somebody made the world like the Bible says, God created it, or the world just made itself like the humanists believe. It just is self-existing and not created. Well, if the world just made itself, how could this happen? Boy, the devil thought about that for a long time. And finally, one day, he came up with the Big Bang Theory. About 18 or 20 billion years ago. That's a long time. All the matter in the universe. That's a lot of stuff. By the way, the word universe comes from two Latin words. Uni, which means single, and verse, which means a spoken sentence. Did you know we live in a single spoken sentence? God said, let there be. Now, that'll preach, man. There's a sermon in there someplace right there, okay? And if your pastor can't find it, he ain't got no preaching him at all, okay? All the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. Say what? Everything in the universe squished into a dot smaller than a period on